We gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, everyone, or whatever time of day it is when you're watching this video, made for the 10th Sunday after Pentecost, August 9th, in the year of our Lord 2020. It's been a difficult week in the world and in our country. Hurricane Isaias has made its way up the East Coast, um, bringing lots of flooding and destruction in certain places. We offer our prayers for the victims of the hurricane and a terrible explosion in Beirut, uh, an explosion beyond comprehension um, that could happen outside of a war has destroyed such a large part of that city and so many lives. Um, our Lutheran disaster response is there and is helping. Your contributions to Lutheran disaster re response can help speed those efforts along, um, both here in our own country and around the world in places of disaster. So please consider a donation this week um, to replenish the coffers as Lutheran World Relief um, pours out its offerings of help and aid to those who are most in need. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God, our defender, storms rage around us and within us and cause us to be afraid. Rescue your people from despair. Deliver your sons and daughters from fear. And preserve us all in the faith of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Some of you may know this already, but last Sunday evening um, after dinner, I experienced uh, very quickly uh, an onset of a fever and a very bad headache. I've had a few migraines over the years, um, and this was about as bad as those. Um, I tossed and turned through the night, and the morning light came, and the headache was gone, and so was the fever, but my doctor ordered a COVID-19 test. I waited all week here, um, quarantining pretty much here at the, at the parsonage and around campus um, until those test results came back, which they did this morning. Unfortunately, they were positive. I think I have contacted everyone with whom I had even minimal contact um, in the few days preceding last Sunday, August 2nd, and since then. But if I haven't called you, and we have somehow been within six feet of each other, and I didn't remember, please uh, call me and let me know, and I'll put you in touch with the, uh, the health authorities who can inform you of the proper um, quarantining procedures. For those of you who are concerned about me, I feel fine. My symptoms only lasted about 10 hours, and I felt great all week and have gotten a lot done around here, um, but I am concerned for those um, with whom I was working. Um, there was a family to whom I ministered um, in a funeral on Friday, uh, who knew about my situation but wanted me there in the graveyard anyway. We were all wearing masks and uh, taking care at a distance. Um, there's been a lot of work here in the building as we've moved a lot of our Sunday school furniture from the education building down to our new space. Um, so some good physical labor, which is not bad for the soul. So thanks for your prayers for me. I've already had, it seems, a speedy recovery. So even more thanks for your prayers for those who are in much greater need this week, um, those who are suffering much more from the virus, those who have lost loved ones to the virus or for any reason, uh, those who are in the paths of hurricanes and disasters, and especially the victims of the explosion in Lebanon. Um, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God, our defender, storms rage around and within us and cause us to be afraid. Rescue your people from despair. Deliver your sons and daughters from fear and preserve us in the faith of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen.
The Holy Gospel for this week is according to St. Matthew in the 14th chapter. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself. There he prayed. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat battered by the waves was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. One of the points of this story about Jesus, and others like it in the Gospels, where Jesus does something really unusual, or exhibits unusual powers, especially over nature, is that this human being from Nazareth called Jesus has another identity, though it may often be hidden from his disciples. Here in the story of Jesus walking on the water, we see Jesus from Nazareth to be also the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ, the living Word of God, whose whole life was lived to be understood as another speech, another communication of that same voice that called the wind and the waves into into the beginning of creation, and who still calls forth their obedience today. So to listen to Jesus, to try to understand what Jesus is up to and what he means, that is the best way we have to understand what God is saying to us, to wrestle with his life and teachings, continuing that wrestling metaphor from last week, is to be wrestling in some way, somehow, with God. So, we hear a story about Jesus and a boat and a storm and his disciples, and a peculiar interaction with one of those disciples out there on the water, with Peter. And we look on this story of Jesus with our minds and hearts formed also by the Easter story, Jesus' resurrection story. These stories also feature Jesus acting outside of usual expectations, coming and going through closed doors, walking along with his disciples and then disappearing after the bread is broken. Some scholars suggest that this story, Jesus walking on the water, should really be understood as a resurrection story that somehow got slipped back in to the stories of Jesus' regular life. While that might help us make some sense of where such a striking and interesting stories comes from, kind of like the story of Jesus' transfiguration on the mountaintop, for another example. It doesn't really get us any farther down the road to understanding what it has to do with us. So let's try to do that. The setup is pretty simple. Jesus tells his disciples to head across the water in a boat, and the wind is kicking up. After a time of prayer during the night, the Bible tells us, as if this would happen all the time, Early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. Okay, but apparently this doesn't happen all the time. How do we know? Because the disciples are terrified. They cry out in fear, it's a ghost. This is not normal behavior, even for Jesus. So he reassures them, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. So far, everyone's acting as we might expect, having been reading along through the gospel story. Jesus is doing something unusual, like he often does. The disciples are reacting like normal people, not understanding. And Jesus is reassuring them, using one of his favorite pieces of advice. Do not be afraid. Do not fear. But then, Peter gets involved. And here's where the story gets wobbly, right? Here is where our own prejudices might start to interfere. Here is where we find ourselves interpreting. 
Here is where Peter either does the right thing, but he does it very poorly, or Peter does the wrong thing in an exemplary way. Which does it seem like to you? Maybe you've heard this story before. Maybe you've already read a Bible study on it or a whole book about it. There are plenty. Well, let's look at the first option. Let's consider them both. But is Peter doing the right thing by jumping out of the boat? He has been reassured by Jesus. He wants to follow Jesus' example, it seems. So he asks Jesus' permission, and Jesus says, come. He's all about it after that. Over the side he goes and walking on the water, heading for Jesus. There goes Peter, except like a new rider on a bicycle, as he builds up a little speed, he looks around and realizes that he's way out of control here. And within a moment, blub, 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 down he goes. There's no evidence that Jesus nicknamed him The Rock because he knew Peter was a sinker, but the name fits. What's the problem? The story tells us right away. You have little faith, Jesus asks him. Why did you doubt? Jesus asks him, but there's no answer given by Peter or by the narrator. We can only imagine why Peter doubted, why he felt of such weak or little faith. Maybe the hard water felt funny on his feet. Maybe it's the big waves, the story hints. Maybe they threw him off balance, taking away his self-confidence, a confidence that was unwarranted. I know what that feels like. Check this out. Whoopsie! <laughs> Haha, just as I got up on top there on that surfboard, the waves of another big boat crossed in front of us and they tossed me right over. I wasn't ready for those big waves. Neither was Peter. But from this point of view in the story, Peter does the right thing, right? Maybe he does it in the wrong way. Maybe for the wrong reason. He was eager to show off. He had a lot of self-confidence, but he didn't have enough faith, enough trust to sustain the miracle of walking on water. He couldn't get to Jesus that way. In this interpretation of the story, Jesus' question to Peter implies that what he was doubting was Jesus' invitation to come. As in, come join me out here. I asked you to come join me. Why did you doubt that you could? In this interpretation, the takeaway for us might be, we'd better be ready. When God or life is calling us to some big change, to some big challenge, some scary uncertainty, we'd better be prepared with an adequate supply of faith to overcome our doubts. Otherwise, we'll go sinking down too, like Peter. Best to learn how to put our trust in Jesus and to overcome those doubts. Hmm, maybe. Do you like it? Do you like that version? Some people really dig it, man. In this story, they see a model of bold faith, a model for big moves, for jumping out of the safe boat or this comfort zone and taking big risks for Jesus, trusting that, well, trusting that he will catch our hand if we sink, but otherwise learning we better not let any doubts creep in or danger is close at hand. You have little faith. Why did you doubt? Well, why did he? Why do we? Why might we? I'll let you ponder that question for yourselves, at least for now anyway, because I want to move on to the second way that we might hear this question. This question, you have little faith, why did you doubt? To hear it this way, we have to understand that Peter is maybe not doing the right thing at all, poorly, but that he's doing the wrong thing very well. Let's consider. In this way of hearing this story, Peter has totally misjudged the situation, misunderstood what's going on. Let's just review. After a night of on the stormy waters in the boat, Jesus comes walking to all the disciples in the middle of the sea. In the boat, the disciples are terrified, and Jesus reassures them. But what does Peter do? He puts Jesus to the test. 
Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Who would speak to Jesus like that? I'll tell you who. The devil, that's who. And you don't have to take my word for it. Go back to chapter 4 in Matthew's Gospel. After Jesus' baptism, the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from this pinnacle, for it is written, You shall not dash your foot against a stone. Just like the devil, Peter does exactly the wrong thing. Peter throws a temptation out to Jesus. Peter tests Jesus. Instead of trusting that it was Jesus coming to them, that Jesus was present with them in the midst of the storm, he wanted proof that it was Jesus, right? Instead of rebuking Peter like he rebukes the devil back in that part of the story, instead of giving Peter a strong word or teaching him by quoting some scripture, here Jesus invites Peter to experience his own failure. Peter is not the Lord of the wind, the sea, and the waves. That is God's territory out there. So Jesus invites Peter into a humbling experience. Not only can he not walk on water, he can't even swim in it. Lord, save me! So how do we hear that question this time? The question Jesus asks at the end. You have little faith, Peter. Why did you doubt? It's not a question this time about the doubts that led Peter to fail in his quest to walk on water. Instead, it's a question about the doubts that led Peter to test Jesus, to get himself some solid proof, some certainty that Jesus really was that vision, a word, an experience of God with them and for them on the stormy sea. He wanted some certainty in a situation in which he still doubted that he could stay in the boat and trust that promise that came to him and all the disciples there from the one who also encouraged them, do not be afraid. Well, which one do you like? Peter the jumper, doubter, sinker? Or Peter the doubter, tempter, sinker? I don't know how much it really matters. Jesus never invites anyone else to express their faith by jumping in over their heads. Unless hearing the commandment to love God and love your neighbor as yourself has us in over our heads already, Jesus' invitation to follow him keeps our feet firmly planted on the ground in our neighborhoods, firmly seated on the benches with our family and friends and neighbors side by side, walking through this world, maybe sailing through its stormy seas together. We don't have the luxury of jumping out of our boat and choosing our own private journey with Jesus on a quest for certainty that never has any doubts. Jesus invites such jumpers, if we're reading the story this way correctly, back into the boat as he invited Peter back to ponder not the certainty of our own faith or the lack of it, but to ponder the certainty of God's promise that there is good reason not to fear, even in the midst of the storm. Good reason to trust that God is with us. Indeed, in the scriptures, we learn in many ways that it's not the size or the strength of our own faith of which we need certainty. It's not that we need to prove our faith, brothers and sisters, to ourselves or to others around us. It is our lot to continue, however imperfectly, in the life of the church, the life that feels so often like being in a boat on a stormy sea, to continue that life while trusting that amid the many uncertainties and doubts that we do have, the certainty of God's love for us is not in doubt. I am the Lord your God. Luther said, amidst all the many hells in which I have lived, if I could only hear that word, I am your God, and cling to it, I'm saved. For we know that we are, that we exist, that God has made us out of nothing. Everything that we know and experience only makes meaningful sense if this is true. 
when we try to exert ourselves without our neighbors to have God or Jesus outside the boat or simply to be outside the boat all by ourselves on our own without God at all, to find our own way around the storms or the sins or the unsavory companions that huddle on the benches of the ship with us, when we try to do any of that, we've asked too much. And so we trust the promise now that God is with us through this pandemic time, through this global storm of turmoil, through this national reckoning, through the personal losses of stability and closeness and security and all the things that make life feel normal that we are missing in these days. Take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. Hear those words of Jesus today, brothers and sisters, wherever you are, however you're feeling, and whatever is the source of that feeling, that doubt. The certainty which Jesus speaks is our salvation. Our doubts will undoubtedly linger. Nevertheless, his promise is sure. Amen.
Now let us pray for all God's people, near and far, for everyone according to their needs, for the church and the world, and all those especially in the face of disasters this week. O Lord, we pray for your one holy Catholic and apostolic church in all of its shapes and sizes and all of its forms and beliefs, ministering to your people around the world. Give your people strength and faith to trust in your promise amid the storms of life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Those storms crash around us, O God, in the form of hurricanes and thundering floods, but also in the destabilizing pandemic, in the blowing of divisive political winds, in the stifling heat of poverty and inequality and injustice, in the turmoil of violence, protest, and disasters. Bless your people, O God, with your presence and peace. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Help us, O oh God, to serve you, to hear your assurance, to have courage, and not to dwell in fearfulness. Make us faithful stewards of your gifts and witnesses to the salvation that Jesus brings. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray now that all who are in need may experience your grace, mercy, and peace. For the victims of the recent hurricane Isaias and the explosion in Beirut, and for all who are bringing rescue in the midst of disasters, for those who are sick with the coronavirus, and for all who are caring for them, for Pam Joy, Roz Martin, Kim Newmar, Joe Nolt, Jean Shaw, Charlie Stoy, and all who were hospitalized this week, for those in prison. For all who mourn, for David Hartman, Carl's brother, and for all others whom we name before you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, we pray for all who mourn the loss of loved ones, for the faith to trust in your promises when we are sinking down. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear these prayers, O Lord, and all the prayers of our hearts, as we offer them all to you in the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Wherever you are, wherever this video finds you this week, may you be at peace with God and one another and find ways to love and serve the Lord. May God's peace be with you always, brothers and sisters. It's good to be with you. Even though I can't see you, I trust that you are watching. Please feel free to reach out by email or text or phone call and keep me posted on what's happening in your lives um, as we go through this difficult time together. Thanks again for watching. See you next week.